Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I'm sure we'll continue to have people roll in through the day. That's pretty much how it works. People come, people go. Hopefully, you all uh, hang out with us. Uh, we've got uh, some cool tech talks going on this morning. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to play on the dyno just a little bit uh, with uh, this slow car back here. And um, I think Scott Clark's actually going to use it to uh, do a little demonstration and that sort of thing, too. Um, so, and then after that, we've got a band coming. They're going to do a one hour set at two, four, and six o'clock. So, kind of break things up a little bit, and we'll hang out and continue to try to have a good time. Um, it looks like that's pretty easy to do. As soon as you start pulling cars in the parking lot, I think we could just walk around and look and talk for hours. So, we'll do some of that. Um, so, again, I'm Jerry Hoffman. This uh, guy handing out decals over here, that's Bruce Bowling. You might have heard of him. Um, We've got uh, Phil Tobin from EFI Analytics right here, and Brian, who works with Phil. Um, let's see, where's somebody else? There's James Murray and Ken Culver in the back, the firmware guys for uh, MS2 Extra and MS3 firmware. So uh, if it doesn't do something you want it to do, that's who you go yell at. Um, Scott Clark's back there. You're going to get to hear from him just a little while. He's tuned a couple cars. You, you know, probably heard a thing or two. Um, so anyway, we're going to get kicked off now. We're going to, well, Bruce is handing out decals. Maybe i got to stall for a few more minutes. Hey, Bruce. It's <laughs> All right, so we're skipping Bruce's presentation. Now, now Bruce is going to start with uh, just, he wants to tell you a little bit about what he's been up to this day, or these days, and uh, what's eaten up all his time, and where his focus has been a little bit. So he's going to talk for a few minutes, and then Scott Clark will be up next. So look what all this has become. Here you are. When did y'all get here? Yesterday. You've been here all this morning. Wow. How many people do we have out here? And you all race heads? You all like you like going to go fast, right? Lots of power. Yes. <laughs> Who wants to go slow? Who wants to go really slow? <laughs> I don't know if y'all heard me, but there's coffee out there if y'all need to wake up. So. Yeah, this is... <laughs> right. Kind of the guy... I think this was back in 1999 when I started this on my bench, trying to make a really simple EFI controller. And my whole goal was to keep it as simple as possible, Minimal I.O. and keep it that way. And simple as a function. Yeah, oops. Y'all are here because this simple idea has grown, 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 and gotten huge. Right? Every day, look, look around, look around, look. We have pros. I never thought there was going to be a pro. Look at the pros. They're everywhere. They're on the, cars are littered all over the place with this stuff. Look, look at the walls. Look at, look, look at the equipment. Look at all this. This is pretty cool. Look at you guys who are actually putting it on there. So applause goes back to you for actually taking the simple idea and making it better and better and better and better. It's not just us. It's you guys with the feedback. So clap for yourselves. More clap. Really? Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. That's why you get a sticker out of all this, okay? So you, you, get, you got your payback. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, what have we been working on? All right, everything has gotten bigger and bigger. A lot of cylinders, lots of fuels, lots of controls. Well, it was about a year ago. Al Grippa, who's not here because he's actually working on this other thing we're going to talk about, gets a phone call. You, most of you have met Al. He's in his 70s, and Al's kind of Al, okay? Let's say better words. Someone calls him on the phone. Now, Al likes to live in a, in, a, in a cave, be left alone, do his stuff, work on it. Someone calls him and says, hey, uh, we're a major company, and I can't talk about the company name, unfortunately. Hopefully, I don't slip it out. Um, and we work with single cylinder engines that are used in commercial applications. Think of engines that show up at, let's say, Harbor Freight, or somewhere like, um, Sears, right? You've all seen those engines. What type of technology are they still using to this day? Carburetors. And magnet, absolutely right. Why do you think they still use this? It works. I heard it. Well, it works, that's right, it works for what they're trying to do. No government intervention, no government intervention yet. 
until now. And there's multiple government intervention. And part of it is EPA, okay? So the EPA has, they're trying to reduce emissions, you know, so, you know, you know, everything's green, keeping the planet alive, that's great. Uh, and we know with the mechanical carburetor, you can only go so far, right? They don't have any sort of control. Whatever it's drilled, and whatever the little orifices and diaphragms are set there, that's what it has to do for everything, okay? They work amazingly well, and they still do. They're not gone, but as the numbers get tighter, the um, requirements to keep the controls gets more and more complicated, okay? And we're, we're talking about one cylinders. These are like three horsepower, 15 horsepower, that, those single one cylinder, you know, now they kind of tilt them on the side because the cylinder's sitting so big, but they're one cylinder engines. Um, there's a whole other section of government regulations where these engines are used in a lot of places. Pressure washers, uh, pumps, etc. And people will use these generators, well actually they will misuse them. People will take, let's say they take a transfer pump, hey their basement flooded out. They'll take a transfer pump, one of these engines, and bring it into the basement, start it up, pump water for five hours. They all drop dead, why? Carbon monoxide poisoning. That's the other regulations coming down to these single cylinders which are used for uh, um, consumer use. They're dangerous, they can be dangerous and there's nothing you can do about it. So they, they, this guy going back to Al, calls up Al, German guy, German access, and says, uh, we saw your mega squirt, uh, we, we would like to use it for a commercial application. And Al says, well I'm not interested. Typical Al, this is how he is. Al says, and these are the words, because these are repeated back to me from the company over and over. The, the, the person asks Al, well, do you know of anybody who can do this? And Al's cons answer was, well, if I knew someone, I'd hire him. Click. <laughs> now, remember, Al gets these weirdo calls from people of hydrogen, all these weirdo, nerdiest of the nerd people call him. So here's a guy who's actually a real deal, and Al hangs up on him. Okay. Well, the guy calls him back. Okay, so evidently they want this because he would have just said, well, you know, screw off, I don't want you. He calls back and then uh, Al passes it to me. I'm slightly a little bit more not as abrasive. I'm still abrasive, but not as bright. So I start talking to him and actually seeing where this is going. And it turned out there was an engine manufacturer back in 2005 who got a V2.2 board, MS2, Al's code, really, really, really early version of Al's code, very early. Uh, no ignition, just batch injection, crummiest of the crummiest. They went out and they made a little throttle body um, that had, had electronic controls for the throttle. They, they modified the, the, the PID inside of that to, do, to run that. Um, and they um, ran it. And they've had this engine for 10 years. They actually took it to emissions. It passed emissions. It blew away the carburetor. The very simple thing we backed in 2005, I mean, this is 10 years ago, they did this, they were like, it blew emissions out. So over the last 10 years, this engine manufacturer has been hauling this little thing around, showing manufacturers, look at this EFI system we have. So that simple thing to all of you is like, well, that's 10 year old technology. To this world was like, wow, this thing passed emissions, this thing runs great. We gotta have this. And the manufacturer we're talking to has looked at other systems out there targeted to to, to uh, uh, commercial single cylinder, two cylinder applications. And the 2005 technology is far superior to all these systems out there now. Which, all right, which kind of, what, what I'm getting at with that is you guys are taking that and done another notch above or two notches above. So. Where you guys are compared to what people are selling, like I said, at the Harbor Freights or uh, you know, uh, those type of stores is so much higher uh, for passing. These things will pass emissions and whatnot. So they come to us and they say, we want to make a custom solution for, our, for, for these engines. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to have Phil talk a little bit about it too. This is where the fun becomes because when you're dealing with, a, now we're doing with a company, many hundreds of thousands, Every one billionth of a penny counts. 
Okay, so it's not how beefy and how much I can get for it, it's how little you can get for it because it, it, they, they worry about a billionth of a penny. I mean, it, it's crazy, but you gotta make it reliable and it's gotta pass emissions. And I don't know. It, here. Talk about something emission. Phil, Phil did all of the calibrations and helped munging the simple software into something a little more complex for them. He did all the engineering behind it. He, him and Brian back here too. Wave to the crowd, Brian. I, I guess it, from the emission standpoint, it was actually really interesting doing all the work on the single cylinder. At first when it's like he's telling me we're going to work on the single cylinder, I'm like, no, I want to go work on my race car. I don't want to, what, what the hell am I playing with a lawnmower engine for? But getting to go to the labs and actually see the results on the emissions, it, it, we got to learn a lot. And the personality of a single cylinder, because suddenly now, normally when you're tuning a big old V8 or something, you're actually, uh, you're working with a lot of averaging because you've got a whole bunch of cylinders, they're smoothing it out. When you're looking at one single cylinder, you get to look at it in a pure for form. Like one of the first things you find is you quickly need to be sampling map right on the right angle or it sits there and you have absolutely no tuning resolution on there. Now from the emissions side, what's really interesting too is this is where they're hitting the wall where the emissions keep getting tighter on them and the CO coming down. And that's very much a competing factor because the emissions they basically measure, they're taking hydrocarbons plus NOxes. And naturally you run richer, you're going to get more hydrocarbons. You run leaner, you're going to get more NOxes. Now the thing is, is that the NOxes as you go leaner start climbing way faster. So what ends up happening with these carburetors is they're running them way fat. In order, some of these things are running at 10 to 1 at wide open in order to stay under the emissions numbers. Hence, that's why they're pumping out CO like mad. And, and so by actually managing that, and that's where now we're able to calibrate it so is that, well, in a lot of places you don't need to be running so rich because now you can control it at all different load points and whatnot in order to really dial it into what it needs, especially if you throw in a catalyst. And to Bruce's point on that, the other barrier that's always been in the small engine world is cost. They're so cost sensitive. I mean, they don't want to be throwing another hundred dollars to s sell a device because obviously they can put an EFI logo on it, but how many people care that much if they're going to, you go and buy a weed whacker, well, you buy them for a hundred bucks. If it's going to cost another fifty bucks more, I'm not interested, you know, I'll take the carburetor. But with the volume they do and their supply chain, it's amazing how cheaply they can drive down the costs of it overall. So it, it, it's been actually rather educational all in all. It, it, it's been a, a rough project in, at points, but at this point it, it's really come along and we're close now to, to moving into the next levels on it there. So Yeah, a lot of, a lot of it was uh, big company, Big politics. Okay, so this was the first. You guys are easy to work with. You know, something. You know, you know. James Ken's put something in there in the code. You guys do it and say, "Hey, this is great." And they do it the next day like that. Uh -uh. When you're doing big companies, and you probably all a lot of you work for big companies. These are big companies, and first, there's, they they know they have to move to it, but they like the carburetor. It's the same deal that you all face every day when you're telling this technology and telling others who are not using it, and. There are a lot of, well, I want to go this way, I want to go this way, or I want to have whatever on this single cylinder. I mean, people in marketing want to have this thing connected to the cloud. Everybody's thing, you know, they, they go crazy with these things. But, of course, then the cost kicks in. You can't do that. Um, one thing I want to do I'm gonna, uh, is, put up, can you put up the slide? I'll let Phil talk this a little bit, but there were some requirements with this. They worry about different things than you guys worry about, okay? And if you've all ever torn apart a lawnmower engine, which everybody, who has not? All right, that's easier to say. You know that little flapper thingy in there that goes to get, there's a flywheel with a bunch of veins on it and it's that little flapper thing? That the plastic white little thing? You know what that's for, right? It's a governor, okay. Well, most of us rip that off, right? And then hook it up so it's full, full throttle, you know? And they, they're expecting that. Um, it turns out that little thing, it's got so much engineering behind it because a lot of these applications, like let's say a pressure washer. Pressure washer runs at 3600 RPM. And 
it's got to stay at 3600. If you throw a load on it, from low load to high load, it's got to stay at 3600. The, the, the requirements are incredible. It's some number like uh, plus, or minus. plus or minus 20 RPM and whatnot. And yeah, there's no feed in, in some applications, much more tight than others. Yeah, yeah some aren't that tight. But. And overall, from, from load to load, it's something like 300 RPM. It can't dip down plus or minus 300 RPM from that 3600 if you have no load to infinite load. Okay. Now, we know we have pressure washers out there and they're going, ee, 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 you know, so, but when they leave, they will be working right. But, you know, there's degradation and all that. But when they're working right, and these things are highly tested. They do 500 hour testing on these, on these engines. Pull them back off of check emissions to check these type things. Um, so there's a lot of engine behind it. It's not just they throw an engine out there. They're, this is their care about. So I'm gonna let Phil talk about this and what this shows you. Yeah, well, what By only one slide. Well, what this shows is that while they tell us plus and minus 20 RPM, apparently they weren't achieving it. Because when we went out and actually started capturing the data logs for how regulated they were keeping their speed control compared to that was one of our biggest challenges in order to make sure, well, I guess backing up just a bit, part of their cost to save money to pay for the AFI, what they were really trying to do was remove the mechanical governor. And now if that could be controlled by the EFI controller as well, well, some money they save there, they can apply towards EFI. And so what we were doing, we took on the left side is actually a carburetor that we just rigged up to capture the data on and see how well are they really yeah, doing Brian, at the speed point. Brian did that. He, he hooked that whole thing up and that's data from a production buy it off the shelf engine with that little control. And, and this is actually a much earlier because this, yes. this was an early prototype, this actual screenshot because we've tightened that up a whole lot more now. But, but yeah, so the biggest thing you see too is that, well for one, the way the mechanical governor is working under very light load it isn't even really targeting 3,600. It's up at 3,800, 3,900. The higher the load, the closer it actually gets to actually making in numbers. Over here, you know, because we're doing it electronically, we're, we're really targeting the whole way across. Light load was one of the biggest challenges, and that's where we've really tightened that up right now. So this is like across on the X's, different load steps. Okay, and then you let their engine run, and it takes the data. Up and down is this 3,600 RPM and the variation in it. So that's why you see these, these clusters because we're, this system, when it fires up, it can go to any RPM it wants. It's capable of you putting a pot on there and you can make it engine and it'll just follow it. It'll do steps. When you shut down, it'll idle and then kill itself. It's got uh, the systems like all the stuff like, you know, if you have a fault, if there's an emissions fault, it's got to shut the engine down. And you got to have a way of being able to pull error codes out of it. So you, do, you can turn the key switch on and off several times. It'll get into these modes. Um, but uh, like Phil was saying with this, uh, uh, the, the uh, mechanical, you see this slope, right? That's what Phil was saying. See how it slopes up? Uh, less load, it goes higher. And then as the load pulls down, the mechanical one goes down to the 3600. So they can't get that tight uh, regulation that an electronic system can, which is over there. And like Phil said, this was our first shot. Now, Chris, they came back and said, well, can you make it better? It's all right. So that's where you start refining it. That's where you start going deep in the project. Uh, and so it's much, 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 much better now. When this thing's running, you'll look at Tuna Studio, nothing moves. We're not averaging or anything. Cycle to cycle, you think Tuna Studio is frozen. Map, everything else is frozen. It's that consistent now. You know, of course they want it better, so. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to tell you what we've been working on for a year. At some point, we hope in the next year and a half, You'll be able to go to your Sears or a place like that or Harbor Freight and you'll be able to go up to a single cylinder engine and you'll be able to look up and you'll see the Mega Squirt little Squirt logo on it and it'll actually have the same technology you're using has now branched over to the commercial world. And like I said, as long as it's from you, your feedback and I forgot to thank a couple people. They're in the back. Jerry and company. Is Jerry here? We forgot to clap for Jerry. Because <laughs> he, he pulled us off, and all the DIY, it's not just Sherry, I'm sorry, because they're, they're all heads, what am I, they all, all the DIY pipes, you got to clap again. <laughs> I want you to clap for Ken and James, because they've taken this, they're like, louder, louder. And then we have a lot of people on support, there's Scott Clark, uh, there, uh, uh, Andy's over here, there's a lot of people, I'm not picking one person, Wes is over here, I want to clap for them too, because they keep the forums going. 
So you don't ever see me on forums. I'm off doing this stuff because if this stuff goes, it just helps all the way around. It's a different world. It's fun to explore it. That's why we're kind of sharing it with you. We don't know where this leads. We hope it leads to good, good places. So far, it's led to really good places. They're very interested. I'm kind of surprised because the controls and stuff we thought were, hey, they're OK, they're great for race. Well, they're being applied now to stuff that you could buy and bring home with you for, for your consumer stuff. That's cool you know, for emission stuff. So we'll keep you updated on how this goes. And uh, like I said, hopefully in the next year, year and a half, you see these products at home. And so, you know, they can call these guys again and say how to fix it, right? <laughs> that's all I have. Anything else? Uh, no. That's it. Cool. Thanks, Bruce. Put your stickers in a good place. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Um, just real quick on that point, yeah, he was talking about support staff. There's also our tech support team. We're 16 strong now as a company as a whole. I mean, this, and I want to say thank you to all of you guys because we wouldn't be there with, without you. I mean, this was something, um, gosh, 10 years ago, I was building a car and needed a controller and ran into this and saw that, gosh, they've got something really cool going on, but the distribution model's just not there yet. Um, what can we do about that? Jumped into it thinking it'd be something I'd do very temporarily and have to get out of and would never really replace my day job. And man, it's just turned into a blessing of an opportunity to mix that day job, which was IT work, uh, which I was always good at with cars, which I always loved, um, and to do something I love and now get to take care of not just my family, but 16 you know, people and their families total. So thanks to everybody for that. Um, those that are here, we got maybe close to half of our team here right now. We've got Russ Patrick back here. He loves to be on camera and called out in, in public. So um, Ben Baruch is, uh, and, and John Black back here. John's our new marketing guy. Um, so uh, you'll be probably hearing some more from him. We've never had a marketing guy. It's been one of the millions of hats that I've had to wear. Um, actually, I like this hat a lot. Um, but. Uh, the, the uh, marketing thing was something I never had time for. So as we grow, I brought somebody in, and we're going to try to. He's going to try to help get us into, you know, more tuning shops across the country. So that when you're looking for a tuner for your car in Cincinnati, we have somebody right there. We can say, hey, check, you know, talk to this guy. We know he does a good job. So we're looking to expand that out, and we think it'll drive sales up too. And you know, the tuning shops, um, we're going to continue always doing our hardcore do-it-yourself stuff, and, and even moving that forward in some ways. Um, but the tuning shops, what appeals to them is what you see on this board right, right here, by and large. It's the plug and play stuff, it's the MS3 Pro, um, and, and a couple other products that fall into what we're calling our Mega Squirt Pro line. Um, and uh, you know, they want, they want that polish, they want that connector, they want, uh, in, in some cases, water resistance, that sort of thing. And I guess I wasn't planning to jump here right now, uh, but I'll talk through this real quick. We have a, a number of Megasquirt plug and plays, and these are our Gen 2s. All of those are based off the MS2 processor, and they're for a variety of vehicles. Um, largely imports, but uh, we, we have some other stuff too, the, the, the Ford Eek 4s uh, for 5 liter cars. Um, then you've got your MS3 Pro here, which is your generic YRN. You've got uh, 8 cylinder sequential fuel and spark, actually up to 12 on the fuel side. Um, so you could do a 12 cylinder with wasted spark and do the fuel sequentially. Um, a number of other outputs, built-in SD data card logging, um, knock detection and correction that's very, very good, et cetera. So we took this box, we took the main board out of it, and you'll see in these two units here, that's what's called the MS3 Pro module, and it's essentially the exact same main board that's in this box, but put into a modular format so that we could then start building plug-and-play ECUs around it for vehicles that needed that higher level of I.O or the higher capability that the Megasquirt 3 uh, processor and firmware offers. So uh, we've currently got two models released. We just released them recently. We wanted to make, we, we took our time making sure everything was right, making sure we had the production pipeline, you know, ready to, ready to actually be able to supply stuff. And the first release was uh, the o, no, 2000 to 05 Mazda Miatas, and including the uh, Mazda Speed turbo cars, um, which is kind of appropriate, because if you go back to when we first released our first generation of plug and plays, that was for uh, the earlier Miatas. So we're going to go back and hit those with some of the, the Megasquirt PNP Pro stuff as well. Um, but additionally, we've got, uh, let's see, what do we got? 44 stuff here. We've got uh, Corvette ZR1s, the, um, the C4 vets. We had a company approach us and say, hey, if you'll build this for us, we'll buy them. Um, here's an order for 10 up front. And so if y'all have a car that we don't make a plug and play for and you need one, 
We have a program called MSP on De MSPMP On Demand, which is essentially what that company used to get us to build that ZR1 plug and play, where uh, we'll figure out what the, how, the, how to make the numbers work and we'll say, hey, if you'll commit to this number, or if you'll get a group by together that commits to this number and you help us find a test car, we'll make it happen for you. Um, let's see, additionally up here, what do we have? We have the 2JZ, which um, is a motor that I, I like a lot for the you know, Mark IV Toyota Supras. Um, as well as the SE 300s and 400s in the, in the mid-90s. Um, the car that we developed this on is actually sitting right outside the door here. It's that white uh, Mark IV Supra out there, and he's running one right now. Um, does a great job. This car that we're going to play with on the dyno a little bit later belongs to these gentlemen right here. You, I believe, right? Yep, yep. Nice car. Um, no? Come on, he knows. Look at, I mean, his head's bigger than mine. <laughs> Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of that. Um, I meant to, I wanted to, and, and will, bring out the packaging that we use for the MS3 Pro and just kind of show you what, when you order an MS3 Pro, what you get. Because a lot of you guys probably started with our kit stuff and may still use our kit stuff, and it's great. But because of the super tight margins and, you know, how tight that market is, we still ship that in a generic cardboard box and that probably used uh, newspaper that a lady at church brings me so that, you know, it keeps costs down. Um, but with the Pro stuff, we actually went out and... I could have just had somebody vacuum form packaging trays for me, right? But I don't do things the easy way a lot of times. I bought a vacuum forming machine, and, and we actually draw those suckers right here, too. So it's all done in-house. Um, but the packaging is nice. You know, it's, it's not what you might be used to when, if you've ordered a kit in the past. It, it's uh, catering to that different customer, because we realize that there's different markets. So um, that's that in a nutshell. I want to say thanks. I never in my, uh, I never in a thousand years would have dreamed that this little side thing that I started in a spare bedroom at my house would have gone the direction that it has. Um, it slowly though crept and took over the basement and then I had UPS and FedEx and six other cars lined up down the street every day and eventually it's like, gosh, time to move. So, you know, uh, it's gone uh, really well and I want to thank all of you guys for that and gals. I saw a couple. <laughs>